Um, hello everyone, um, my name is uh, Rangaswamy Mothakuri and uh, I'm one of the consultants in uh, Morriston um, Emergency Medicine and Intensive Care. Um, I've also been appointed as the clinical lead for sepsis for Morriston Hospital. Um, the reason I'm doing this talk is basically to make all our doctors, um, juniors and seniors and the consultants aware that we have got a sepsis screening tool and uh, we are trying to currently um, implement um, the screening tool in Morriston Hospital. Um, I will show you how that it looks like. This is what the sepsis screening tool is. Um, and it's basically got a, a front and a back cover. And uh, what we are advocating is that people fill this form. The front sheet goes in the notes and the photocopy stays to, with us for audit purposes. Um, so that is what the sepsis books look like and it will be present in various wards. Um, the reason we have started to do this is this is part of the sepsis awareness campaign in Morriston Hospital. Sepsis, um, as we know, is very common um, and the reason we emphasize this is because sepsis presents in um, a variety of ways. Um, in the recent data released by the UK Sepsis Trust, they have said that there's a 44,000 um, number of deaths directly attributable to sepsis. Um, what we have to be mindful of is that these are only those cases where the word sepsis has either been written in the notes or it has been put on the death certificate. So the numbers may actually be much higher than that. We also know that um, severe sepsis, which is the group with sepsis and organ dysfunction, have a mortality of about 35% more than those patient groups with ST elevation MIs and strokes. Um, we um, need to work towards identifying the signs and symptoms of um, sepsis and severe sepsis early. And the reason for that is the interventions that we do as part of the sepsis 6 are um, very quick to do and very basic. Um, as I said, we are going to do a phased introduction of the sepsis screening tool. Um, we know that at this time, a lot of the doctors will be changing hospitals and coming into Morriston. Um, so what we are planning to do is do a phased introduction. And from the 1st of August, we're going to introduce the sepsis screening tool in AMAU East, West and SDMU. Um, in the following month, in September, we're going to introduce it in Anglesey, Gowers, um, Ward G and Ward A. And in the following month, we'll do it for Ward V, Ward S, and Ward D. Um, when we introduce it in the wards, um, we'll have the sepsis books. We will also have the sepsis trolleys, and we'll have a sepsis notice board outside the ward. The main aim is that everyone is aware that the screening tool exists and uh, fill it in the right way so that we can audit it and, and look at how well we are performing and what can we do to improve. Um, coming to the sepsis screening tool itself, um, the first thing to make note of is that we are going to use news of three as a cutoff to initiate or start the sepsis screening tool. Um, I would like to mention that before in the past, the cutoff used to be a news of four. Even if you look at the news cards, the cutoff on that still is a news of four, but we have changed it. Um, it has been agreed in the trust um, and it has been agreed by the Rails and the Thousand Lives group that the news of three um, is an agreed cutoff for initiating the sepsis screening tool. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's got two um, sheets front and back. Um, please make sure that you put sticky labels, patient identifier labels on both the sheets. Um, the front goes in the notes and the, the photocopy um, stays in the book, which is what we're going to use to audit. Um, so once you've identified that a patient has got a news of three, your next step is to start the sepsis screening uh, tool put the time when you've started your screening and then look for the signs of um, 
sepsis, which is basically the sepsis screening criteria or systemic inflammatory response syndrome, the SERS criteria. You can see that you've got six elements in the SERS criteria. Um, what we are advocating is that you look at all those signs um, and you can see that except for the white cell count, all the other five are something that can be done at the end of the bed very quickly. Um, in some cases, you may have to wait for the white cell count, um, but in some of the wards, you may actually have the results with you when you first go and see the patient. So once you've got the news of three and you've looked at the SERS criteria, if there are two or more, the next question for you is whether this patient has sepsis. Now, it could be a variety of conditions. It's not an exclusive list as it's mentioned in the chart. It could be um, pyelonephritis, pneumonia, tonsillitis, cellulitis, the list goes on. But have a look at the patient and make a clinical judgment as well because if the white cell count is not back, the patient may score only one on the SERS criteria, but you can still see that the patient is unwell. So please proceed on to the side of whether this patient has got sepsis. If you think the patient is not septic, then you just circle the box which says no patient unlikely to be septic. On the other hand, if you think that the patient is septic, then you need to note the time when you identified sepsis because that's the time from which your one hour of completion of sepsis 6 will be calculated. As part of the identification of your um, sepsis 6, um, as part of your identification of sepsis, um, what you would then have to do is consider what investigations you're going to initiate for this patient, which would be either full blood count or a urine dipstick or a chest x-ray um, and or a venous gas to check what the lactate level is. Um, it's very important that we um, highlight at this point that in most of the cases, it will be the clinicians who will have to come and do the blood gases. On some occasions, we may be able to call the outreach team or the nurse practitioners, but the prime responsibility would be with the junior doctors or the registrars. Um, once you've initiated the infection, uh, the investigations, your next step would be to look at the patient and see what elements of sepsis 6 um, need to be completed. Now, if you look at the sepsis 6, you've got oxygen, blood cultures, antibiotics, lactate and hemoglobin, fluid bolus, and urine input and output monitoring. Um, in some cases, the nurses would have started some elements of the sepsis 6. Now, the key to mention at this point is if you think that this patient doesn't need antibiotics or cultures, then please document in the section which says comments box. Because if any element of the sepsis 6 is not completed, we will consider that it's not been thought about or reviewed. So you need to make sure that you put every element um, of sepsis 6 box complete. For an example, if you have a patient who's sitting and talking to you and has got a oxygen saturations of more than 94%, you don't need to put oxygen on him. But rather than leaving the box empty, you need to mention SATs more than 94, oxygen not indicated. If you feel that the patient doesn't need a blood gas or a lactate for whatever reason, please document that. If you think that this patient can walk to the toilet and give you a bottle and he's he is not clinically dehydrated or there's no signs of um, AKI and you don't want a urine input output monitoring, then please document that in the notes. So it is key and it's vital that we have all the elements of sepsis 6 completed because that is one of the key things we are auditing as part of the um, whole campaign. Once you've done all the elements of sepsis 6, you need to put down the sepsis 6 completion time. Um, Coming down below on the path, you can see that you've got a box which says severe sepsis. Now, this is basically um, a box which um, identifies organ dysfunction for you. And you can see it goes through various systems. You've got SATs of more than 94 for a um, non-COPD or 88 to 92 for a COPD patient. You've got some blood gas parameters. You've got um, systolic of less than 90, lactate of more than two. We've also got some um, 
other parameters like your INR, bilirubin, and urine input output. So all those things have to be reviewed with a view to um, depicting signs of organ dysfunction. The one thing that we have mentioned over there is um, no urine output for more than 18 hours. This has been taken from the NICE sepsis guidelines, which was introduced last year. Um, and we are advocating that people actually ask uh, the patients if they can answer back to you as to what was the life last time they uh, passed urine, because we know that a significant number of patients with severe sepsis have associated AKI um, with it. We've also mentioned in the same box signs of red flag signs. Now the red flag signs are heart rate of more than 130, respiratory rate of more than 25, lactate of more than four and just not being alert. The reason they have been categorized separately as red flags is because each of them individually has got a new score of three. Now we've been teaching the nursing staff and the health cares that when they're doing their OBS um, at the start as part of the SERS criteria to go down and look at the red flag signs because if you've got one or two of the red flag signs ticked in, they need to escalate it to the senior nursing staff or the senior doctors um, in the department. So if you notice on the right side of the screening tool, you will notice that there's a section for neutropenic sepsis. So if you've seen a patient who's got a news of three and on the SERS criteria, you notice that he's only ticking one of the boxes instead of two, um, please look on the right side of the form um, if this patient has given you a history of, um, you know, having a cancer for which he's had radio chemotherapy, um, you need to make sure that you look at that side of the form um, and go down the route because what you need to try and ensure is that they have the early antibiotics according to the trust guidelines. Um, so this is basically what the sepsis um, pathway is all about. Um, <clears throat> We, we've also got um, separate teachings um, that we are doing in-house in the ward, but we've also got um, dates available on the internet learning and development page where you can go. Um, these are the dates when we actually do a lecture for one hour um, and we talk in a little bit more detail on sepsis. Um, so in summary, um, what I would like to say is that any patient you know that who's got a news of three, you need to look at and uh, consider starting the um, sepsis screening tool. Um, give a consideration to uh, all the elements of sepsis six, and if they don't have to be completed for any reason, please document the reason there. Um, always look at the red flag signs, and if you've got red flag signs, it needs to be escalated to the clinician or to the senior doctors. Um, and, and just make sure that you use the tool in the right way. Um, we have been made aware of concerns with regards to people feeling the need for duplication of the forms. So um, I'm just going to give a couple of examples so that you understand um, where we are coming from in the sense of the form filling. So if you've got a patient, say in Anglesey or Gower's ward, which is a respiratory ward, or in Cardigan ward, which is the renal ward, you usually have a lot of patients who either are on oxygen um, or have got um, impaired renal functions um, normally. These patients would normally be scoring high on the news card. So when you look at this patient for the first time, they would still go through the initial screening because that is what it is. You're screening everyone who's coming into the department. You do the initial news and if they are using a news of five, and you think that this patient is not septic, then you circle on the not septic box and the form stops there. They then go and have the news as regularly every four hours. And if anything changes clinically, either their news score jumps up or if they become um, unwell because of drowsiness or deterioration or pyrexia or confusion, then one has to go back and consider filling up the form. So there will be many different scenarios where you would think, I don't think um, I need to fill the form or you may think that I'm not sure whether I need to fill the form. If that is the case, please discuss it with one of your senior colleagues. Um, if there is any questions, um, I'm happy to be contacted. I'm happy to receive an email for the same. Um, we will try and arrange for the teaching sessions and we will try and arrange um, sessions of teaching in the wards which you can come and attend whenever we are doing it. 
Thank you.